So it's left to men like Davis Yance to fight. Lawyer R. Davis Yance says by doing this, the military may have violated the constitutional rights. Who has successfully defended naval law. Joyce, now to discuss is military defense attorney Davis Yance. Davis, thanks for being here tonight. Hey, good evening. So Blink insurance has work cut out for him, right? I mean, he has to convince Iran to not attack the U.S. directly, either through its own forces or through a proxy like Hezbollah or Hamas. And yet he's battling against his own administration colleagues with their pro-Iranian circles. What do you make of this current situation we find ourselves in? Well, the, the problem with the situation is that the initial response from the White House, from the United States, was very weak. We, the, the White House played down these attacks. It wouldn't release information about these attacks. And that really emboldened these forces in Iran and these Shiite militias that are run through, that are proxies for extremists within the Iranian government and with Quds forces. That's who these folks are coordinating with and working for. Our initial response was so weak, we are now playing catch up. We're going on four or five days of essentially daily attacks on U.S. personnel in Iraq and Syria. And only now are we responding. But sources over in the Middle East are already saying that our failure to respond has already emboldened our enemies over there. So that's the concern. Um, this feels like we waited and waited, and when things got so bad we couldn't ignore them anymore, now we're responding. So it makes us look weak, and it makes us look like we're disconnected in, in our policy approach. That it does, and like you said, you have rockets and these other attacks raining down on our bases. So far, not calculated in such a way to do damage to U.S. personnel, but they're doing so to say, hey, you know, anything goes on, we can hit you. You, you are within striking distance of us, Iran. And I think that's scary. They're trying to send that message. And like you said, we already look weak in the region, but also, I mean, U.S. pop culture goes everywhere. That's a soft power. It can be used in good ways, but also it's in bad ways because we air our dirty laundry. We air our secrets to everybody. What are these foreign officials listening to when they look at American pop culture? We're talking about our recruitment crisis, our retention crisis in the military, We're talking about mental health issues in the youth, We're talking about obesity rates in the young, We're talking about lack of patriotism. I mean, on and on it goes. They're sitting there and looking going, well, I mean, they, they turn their military into a giant social experiment. So it seems they're going to keep poking and poking and seeing what they can get away with. So when Blinken sits there, and I know he tried to do, look directly into the camera to try and warn off Tehran, but I mean, it's hard for him to do that given his track record, given, like we're saying, the pro-Iranian track record of that spy ring inside D.C., but also just everything that's being reported about where our nation has gone because of the left's takeover. Do you think that makes it even more difficult for Blinken to try and say anything to Tehran because they can say, oh yeah, sure, well, look at all these other reports? I, I absolutely agree. It feels like sort of an idle threat. We have now with withdrawal from Afghanistan and how weak and just disorganized we look in that, that leads up to everything else that's been going on in our military with the recruitment crisis, a retention crisis, disunity, uh, politicians being promoted over combat leaders and a focus in the military on you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion rather than combat readiness. So all of that's out there. Our enemies and adversaries see that and they see the leadership crisis in our military. They see the lack of leadership when, with what happened with Afghanistan. And then Israel gets attacked. Israel gets subjected to these terror attacks. It's from Hamas. They're Shiites. We know Iran is involved. We know money is being funneled from the U.S. to Iran to these groups, uh, we look foolish on an international stage. And then you wait days, you have a disconnected response. You have a president of the United States who can't even articulate where he is or what's happening in the world. And then Blinken has to go out and, and try to be the tough guy when we've already been in disarray. It is dangerous when we do not have clear leadership. And that's from the White House on down. We need strong leaders. We need them to speak clearly and we need a coherent policy. That we do. And I know Iran, whenever they do their, their, their saber rattling, they'll say, well, you know, cease attacks talking to Israel, cease attacks on Gaza, cease the strikes on Gaza, call off the ground invasion, or else we're going to act on behalf of Hamas and these other proxy groups that we are cozy with and we help to fund and all the rest of that. Now, of course, a lot of that reporting is being played up by outlets like Al Jazeera. They have a lot of funding from Qatar. Qatar is a very interesting nation in which the U.S., we use it a lot for our own ends. We, for example, the Taliban negotiations that President Trump first did that was through Qatar. We give Qatar money, we help Qatar and they help us. But at the same time, they're a loading base for Hamas political leaders who live in fancy luxury hotels in Qatar and from which they call for a day of global jihad. So U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was telling Al Jazeera to cool it on some of the reporting on Gaza, you know, whether that be embellishing, lying, whatever, to try and blow the situation up even more to give Iran that 
false veneer, that false cover they would need to launch any all-out attack on U.S. forces or our friends in the region. And I think Al Jazeera for years has played a very interesting role in Qatar as well, trying to fan the flames against us in the Middle East. Is that something we should be nipping in the bud? Yeah, we have to be very, very careful. We have to understand the history of the Middle East, and you just have to understand and have a clear policy towards disparate groups within the Middle East. You have to understand who the Shiites are. Primarily, they have a majority in Iran, in Iraq, in Yemen. Who are the groups that are attacking in Gaza? Who are the groups that are attacking U.S. forces? It's Shiite Houthis from Yemen, and it is um, these other Shiite groups in Iraq and in Syria that are attacking U.S. forces. So that's, it, it's a delicate and problematic balance to understand we have to protect U.S. troops. We have a right to defend ourselves. Israel has a right to defend itself. At the same time, we don't want to give extremists an opportunity to escalate this. But again, we need to approach this from a position of clear strength with a clear understanding of who we are and what we do on an international scale. The United States has to go back to the concept that we are the strongest military in the world, we will retaliate in kind to protect our troops, but we also need to be very careful about what our posture is. We need to be doing things that are just to protect the innocent as a primary. We have to get back to that. We have a foreign policy that's disconnected, and we have these small bases, these small groups of, of American military all over the world, and many of them cannot defend themselves. They don't even have hardened facilities in these locations because we've been doing it piecemeal. That needs to change. That it does, Dave. So I really appreciate your expertise in these matters. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. God bless.